All right. Hello and welcome. Thanks for joining this virtual session about how you can use AI tools to support and empower our multilingual learners, our English language learners, and students who are learning a new language. So I hope you love my background today, Eclipse related. If you would like access to my slides, so the short link for my slides is bit.ly slash all lowercase AI April 8. And that should give you the ability to look through everything, anything that you might need, uh, and you should be all good to go. So with that being said, we're going to go ahead and get going. My name is Brittany Coomer, and I'm the Assistant Director of EdTech here at MBCSC. My email is on the screen, and if you have questions about any of the tools that I talk about in today's session, or if you want to learn about more AI tools or some of the different options and things that we have available in the district, do not hesitate to reach out. I love getting these types of questions and want to be as supportive to you as I possibly can be. So our goals for today are to look at some different AI tools for planning and designing your environment. So some ones that will help you with your efficiency and also being mindful of some of the different needs and variability in your classroom. We'll also look at some different tools that can support areas of UDL. So engagement, which is getting our students excited and motivated to learn, removing some of those barriers that might be challenging for some of them to really focus on what they're doing or might be threatening to them. We'll be looking at different ways that you can present content to students as well, other than just verbal or direct instruction. And lastly, we'll be looking at different ways you can give students to show their understanding, express their knowledge, and build some um, capacity in their different content area skills or reading and literacy that you have in your course. And hopefully by the end of the session, you can identify a couple of tools that you want to use in the near future, whether you set a long-term goal or short-term goal. I just love for you to try to make a plan. If you like to take notes while you learn, I do have a note-taking guide that is on the screen linked on my slideshow presentation. If you want to file, make a copy of that, then it's yours. You can write it out. Or if you wanted to print that note-taking guide beforehand, you can certainly do that and have that as a record of your learning for this PD day. So before I get too far into all of the different tools and things, I want to share some information about what artificial intelligence is and why some of the tools that we're seeing pick up some steam and really be in the news a lot right now are different than some of the AI tools that you might have had experience with in the past. So artificial intelligence or AI are computer systems that are capable of performing tasks that really replicate some of the human activities and human intelligence. So looking at patterns, making connections, making decisions, responding. So it's very advanced type of computing and computers that have been trained to do advanced tasks. And if you're thinking, oh, this sounds scary, that's Skynet, you know, we're gonna be taken over. Not necessarily, we've actually been using AI tools for quite some time. And the true magic and the power in it is how you can use them to boost efficiency and to do things that maybe weren't possible before. So I'll get more into that here in a second. But some of the things that you actually have probably been using before that already have AI in them are hidden in plain sight. So this is just to show you that it's not that scary, that AI is there to boost some efficiency. And it's also been used to personalize content for you. And that's something that you can use to personalize learning for your students. So Google Maps and Waze, that uses AI to suggest the fastest driving route for you or routes that you typically like to take. I know I don't love driving in construction zones and my phone has picked up on that. So it always gives me different options for that. I even like to go the longer route driving wise if I can avoid some of those pieces. Facial recognition on your mobile devices are another example of AI. Spotify, Netflix, Amazon, any type of streaming platform or a really a lot of websites use AI to track where you've been going and to give you suggestions. It's kind of like how sometimes I am thinking about something and then all of a sudden it's like the suggested thing on my Amazon that day. Google search suggestions, Grammarly is a writing assistant that uses AI to help you sound a little bit more polished and poised in what you're saying. And then Google Translate at some point or another, I feel like all of us have interacted with Google Translate. That is a robust AI tool and it's been around for quite some time. So I wanted to give you some examples to get you thinking about what AI can look like and how sometimes it can provide really helpful things to us and save us a lot of time and energy and effort and to transform experiences for us that otherwise might not be possible. So the difference between that and some of the new AI tools that you're seeing out there like ChatGPT, uh, Magic School AI, some of those education focused ones is they're using generative 
AI. And if you're not quite familiar with generative AI, it's a different subcategory or type of AI that generates a response. So it's trained to provide information to you instead of just looking at patterns and giving you a suggestion of where to shop or a link or an item or a resource or a song. It is responding to questions, almost like what a human would do. So that's how it's a little bit of a higher, more complex level of AI than just giving you suggested websites, songs, music, all of those different types of things. Okay, so what AI can do in education, there's a lot of articles out there in research, and this is certainly a hot topic in education. But I think while there are some things we certainly need to be mindful of and keeping our students' data private, not putting tons of personal information into AI, much like how you shouldn't do that on the web anyway, because once it's out there, it's out there. Being mindful of that, there are some really exciting things that AI can do for us as well as our students. So because AI is so quick, it can create things for us on the fly. It gives us the ability to personalize learning for our students in ways that might not be possible before. Like we have some students in our district who are maybe the only people in the whole building that speak a certain language. Um, and chances are maybe not all of us know what that language is, but there might be an AI tool that can provide instruction or resources to students in that language. And how powerful is that for building a sense of community and helping the student feel welcome? Um, a lot of AI tools that students can use can also be set up to provide tutoring or personalized practice. They're adaptive, they're trained to see what questions the students are getting correct, which ones they're missing and make it more challenging or remediate based on that. We can do some of those things as a teacher, but it's really hard when we have 30 or so students in our classroom. This can kind of free us up a little bit so we can go provide feedback, work with those students, but also give them some additional practice without spinning our wheels. You can create resources in multiple language using AI. Uh, it's also just helpful for providing scaffolding. Um, I know when I was in the classroom, I had a lot of different languages at reading levels in my social studies class. And a lot of the times I would go and I would try to adjust the Lexile levels of articles and primary sources I was giving my students on my own. And it, it would take me hours to create the variety of resources I wanted to provide to my students. Whereas some of these tools can do that in a second and just creates an environment where students have the resources that they need to learn without taking tons of time in doing that. And lastly, it just provides some exciting experiences that maybe we might not have. And I'll show you some exciting ways that you can bring life to your classroom. You can take your students to different places using AI tools. So that's kind of the what and the why behind today. And now we're gonna get more into the how. So I'd be remiss if I didn't point out this. And you know, being someone who also has to think about the student data privacy and protection and security pieces around all of this, just know that AI is a machine and it's not perfect. Um, a lot of the tools are only as good as their data set when it comes to AI and the data set is not perfect. They've been trained to answer certain things and it will get things wrong. There are some AI tools that have kind of been known to hallucinate for a lack of a better word. It will just make things up if it doesn't know how to answer the question. So always be, cross-checking your information, always verify, always dig deeper. Don't take it as the end-all be-all. Um, kind of take it as the starting point, but not the final destination. It always needs a human touch, always needs your expertise to go through and verify what's accurate and credible and what's not. And that's the same thing for students. I would just make sure that you're, you're sharing this information with students, just like I'm sharing it with you right now. So on the screen, I just have some tips. Just know that it's biased, that People who are training AI computers are humans, so they also carry some bias and they're not, you know, as 100% accurate in all the data that it's giving out there as well. So just know there's always going to be some little degree of inaccuracy, almost like how when we're reading resources and sources, we always need to look for perspective and notice where there might be some pieces missing or incorrect there as well. Uh, on the screen, I have three examples of three different AI tools that I use. So ChatGPT, um, Bard at the time, now it's called Gemini, and then Microsoft Copilot. And I asked it about a very specific piece of history related to California, where I have some families, family members of mine who live there, and it got the historical information incorrect. So this is very local history. It didn't know what that was. So it just started making things up that I know is incorrect. So just wanted to show you an example there of how it does put some information out there, but it's not always 100% correct. And that's why it's so important that we have teachers, we have humans in the room who can decipher that and then also teach this critical thinking skill to our students to evaluate, evaluate, and to dig into your sources and justify it. 
So when you're using AI tools, there is a little bit of an art to it. Um, they call it prompt engineering or prompting. And the more practice you get with it, the better you'll be. Uh, while AI has grown, it's gotten super intelligent. It cannot read our mind. I know sometimes I say this in presentations, people are like, it can't read your mind yet. Uh, maybe one day, I don't know, we'll see. But uh, it, it doesn't always know exactly what you're looking for based on how you phrase it. I know there's been times where I think I'm being super clear with AI and I type out a question and I go back and I'm like, that was not clear at all. So being specific, being clear, using certain keywords and then providing examples and also giving feedback to the AI trains it to learn your style and what type of information it should be providing to you. So some examples here are that if you're wanting it to create a, a series of instructions for a project that you're doing in your English language arts class and you want it to be at a fifth grade reading level, then tell it to put it at a fifth grade reading level. Otherwise, it might put it out there and it might be you know, too simple of language or too advanced of language for your students and it can refine it. You just have to give it the guidelines and guardrails to do that. So. Now what we're going to do is get into several different AI tools. So for some of these sections, I have slides on tools that really do provide the same features and functions. I'm not going to go through every single one of those. I'm going to show you kind of the, the big tool in that area that I would recommend you start with. And then the other tools that are listed are ones that you can explore. I didn't want to point you only in one direction because I know everyone kind of has their styles and preferences. So I've listed a few, but I'm only going to show you some of them. So as I demo these tools, if you want to pause, this video and pause me from talking to you. You certainly can if you like to kind of work on your own independently and practice without my voice kind of yammering on in the background, okay? So the first series of tools I'm gonna show you are ones that are really teacher focused and for teachers or staff members to use. And these are some of the famous generative AI tools. So what these tools do is they really provide you with an opportunity to design your lessons, to plan your lessons and activities, and rethink about how you can scaffold things or really think about how you can provide more options to your students through the lens of universal design for learning. So I do have links throughout these presentations. Almost every single tool is linked. Um, pictures typically are linked in my presentation as well if you wanna pull those up and be following along. So the first tool is ChatGPT. This is probably the one that you've heard about. So it works on the mobile app um, on the web, like what I'm doing. This is something that students do not have access to. The terms of use and agreements on this are not something that permit our students to have access to it, but you as a staff member do have access to it. So again, I will say a little, little bit of caution here. When you use a tool like ChatGPT, do not put in any personal information, PII, about yourself nor your students. Do not be putting in your full name, address, email, specifics from an IEP. You can put in generals, but do not put in personal information because once it's there, it's out there. Your personal information, you probably don't want it out there and it's not probably best to put your students information because that is their information, not necessarily yours to share. So a little bit of caution on that. But ChatGPT is great for refreshing a lesson. Like if you had one that you did maybe last year and you wanna think about it differently, it can be a great you know, other perspective, other party to give you some feedback on how you can change it. If you are stumped and you're thinking, I wanna build in a discussion activity or something collaborative for my students to do, but I'm sitting here, it's tired, I'm tired, it's been a long day, and I just cannot come up with something. This might help you out. It really can just be helpful in planning units and outlines and essential questions, all of the things. So I'm gonna pull this up right now and give you some examples of what you can do. So I already have an account. You can use this to save your results. That's why it's helpful if you go in and do Google SSO, you can save it, but you could also use this on personal accounts. And I use it on some personal ones too, for like cooking recipes and things like that. So I keep it separate from my work one. But here are some examples. It gives you some suggestions here on how you can come up with some fun things like fantasy football names. You can do that. Love it. Okay. So I'm going to ask it to help me plan a unit on ancient Chinese dynasties for four weeks. All right, so I used to teach seventh grade social studies and this was one of the units that I used to teach. So I'm using it more as a lesson planning tool right now, but if you have a very specific question, you can ask it and just, you know, as you get more experience using these tools, you're gonna see what information it needs, specifics, all of those pieces. So this is giving me a nice outline. So if I wanted to give me more details on each one of these lessons, like objectives for those lessons, criteria, content I should include, I can ask it to do that. So it gave me a nice 
intro, kind of a pacing plan here week by week. So I'm gonna ask it to do something different. Eight A, seventh grade social studies, group discussion activity related to ancient Chinese. All right, so I gave it a specific one. And here we go, it's telling me materials, instructions, and I can even go back and say, I want the instructions to be at a third grade reading level. So it's very simple, very straightforward. I love it for that. I think sometimes as we plan our resources and we plan instructions or write out instructions for our projects, I know I was guilty of this. I would write it out and think it made total sense, but my students weren't there planning that whole project with me every step of the way. So what I thought was clear wasn't probably always the case for them. So that's kind of the beauty of doing this is you can simplify some of the language, which is great if we think about supporting some of our multilingual learners, having the language adjusted a little bit, the reading level adjusted, and you can even ask it to translate content too. So again, translation using AI, like Google Translate even as well, None of those are as great as having a human there to translate it for you. It's never going to be 100% perfect, but it is a starting point. So if I wanted it to translate my instructions for this activity, I could ask it to do that, like translate this. And there we go. That's the same thing, just does it in Spanish. So... Just examples of what you can do. The list can go on and on. You could probably just spend hours tinkering with this tool alone. For anything that you make in ChatGPT, it's not really necessarily here in a format that's ready to go and use. You will need to copy this, paste it elsewhere, and manipulate it, make it look pretty, but it really does act as a nice starting point. So this is where you can copy this, it can regenerate it, or you can say, this wasn't what I was looking for. It'll ask you why, and then try to answer the question again. So that is ChatGPT, it is totally free. There is a paid version of it. That's really if you wanna use some more storage features as well as the ability to create some images and things like that. But there are other tools you can use to do that that don't require a price tag. So just up to you. Here are some examples of how some other educators have used ChatGPT. So writing different DOK level questions. Again, you can use this to write them in multiple languages should you need to. Um, creating activities like odd one out, things that go together and one that doesn't. So giving students those type of questions so they can discuss them in groups and in your class. Other examples of things that we can do, uh, articles. So this teacher created an article and there were some inaccurate bits of information in that article. And the students had to go through and figure out what those pieces of information were. So it could just really help diversify some of the things you might be doing in the classroom. From a planning perspective, it can also be great for giving you some feedback on how you could support some of your multilingual learners. So I, I asked it to come up with a discussion activity for the ancient Ming dynasty. Perhaps my next question should have been, can you give me some ideas of how I could scaffold this for native Spanish speakers in my classroom? might be an idea of how I can give you some insight there. Another example of a generative AI tool that I want to show you, and then I'm going to move on to our next section, is Magic School AI. So Magic School, it used to be totally free, but now there's paid versions. You can still do a lot with a free version. And if you're wondering, how can I get some of those paid features? If you do their certification courses, after you do so many of them, they will extend premium access to you for an indefinite amount of time. They've actually not said when they're gonna take it away. So I don't get the vibe it's gonna be anytime soon, but if you wanna do that, it's super easy. The classes, maybe the certification courses take maybe 15 minutes each, and there's like four of them that you can do. And it's just helpful for giving you experience with the tool. So Magic School is an AI tool, a generative AI tool. So it has those generators, those Q and A type of bots and chat bots like ChatGPT. It uses ChatGPT. And what it does is it creates resources specifically for teachers. So this tool is designed for educators and there are all kinds of ways that you can use it. So on mine, you're gonna see some slight differences. I did go through and I did those training courses. So I do have access to enterprise or their paid version at the moment. I'm gonna write that out for as long as I can. But if you wanna do these courses, I promise they're super easy to do. It's just under their training tab when you go in. So you can make your free account with your BCSC Google account. And then whenever I'm here, this is kind of the main tool. So Raina is their chat bot. So that's where you can get some advice and help and it can point you to specific things. 
Otherwise, I have all of these different generators right here. And these generators are amazing. So I can search for ones that help me with planning, lesson planning, group work, uh, unit plan, PBL, anything and everything is here. Ones with helping me with content. So mass file review, a choice board. Now I always make sure you go through and look at those because sometimes the choice boards, some of the choices it gives may not necessarily align with your learning goals. So again, that's why it's so important to always have that teacher lens and go through and evaluate them. But vocab lists, you can paste in a YouTube video link and it summarizes it. You can paste in a website or YouTube video link and it can create assessment questions or activities around it. It's spectacular, all kinds of things here. You could just spend a significant amount of time just going through. So honestly, if you want to pause the video right now and look at Magic School, I don't blame you because every time I come on here and I'm on this tool pretty much every day, I feel like I see new things, always new things. So clear directions. I love this one. When we're thinking about multilingual learners, making sure the language is clear, it's concise, and my students know what I am expecting of them. Student support. So all kinds of pieces here. If you're thinking about helping some of your multilingual learners, if you're doing some writing activities, maybe giving some sentence starters or frames to help them kind of get past those initial few words about how to start their sentence and build in some scaffolding there for them as well. And then communication are really helping you communicate to students' families and the like. So whenever you see a tool in Magic School that you want to use, you'll just select it. This part up here, I love, it's an exemplar. So it gives you an example so you can get a preview of what this specific generator does before you go in and start using it yourself. So I wanted this to rewrite this text. All right, so I can listen to it. It's great for accessibility, this tool is. I can copy this. And again, with Magic School, you do kind of have to manipulate whatever resource it gives to you. It's not always 100% ready to be exported into like Canvas or Google Slides, Google Docs. You'll probably have to edit it and tweak it a little bit. But it's pretty amazing. So it gives me even some suggested follow-up questions if I want to really dig in and give it more information for a better response. I can type with my voice. I can upload an article or a PDF if I want it to, you know, revise an article or a document I already have. And I can also translate any of my resources as well. So that's another helpful bit here is that anytime I use Magic School, it can translate it into different languages too. And if you are looking at my screen right now and you're like, what is this other tab? What is Magic Student? So this was revealed about two weeks ago. And right now I think it's all of the bells and whistles are available if you do their certification program, but they're not going to get rid of this feature. But Magic School now has a student chatbot feature. So it basically allows students to use the generators, the chats on here with a little bit more safety and security settings and management and control features for the teacher. And before I forget, here is the translate button to where you can select a language for any one of these bots. So you can have it translate things should you need to. Your results are also going to be over here for output history. If you need to go back and retrace your steps, it is there. So Magic Student, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. This is not necessarily a planning tool, but we're here. So I just wanted to show it to you anyway. So Reina for students is just a tutor, a help type of resource. So if I set this up, I have to launch it to my students. I kind of set some parameters on what the chatbot can say and can't say to my students. If you're worried about some cheating and authenticity, that type of thing. Um, chatbots, you know, are a part of the workforce. So I think it's helpful that we give our students some degree of practice with this so they can learn some of those literacy skills like evaluating, prompting, those pieces. But we want to make sure we do it in a secured environment to where it's helping our students academically, not you know, taking some experiences away from them or giving them some false sense of understanding when maybe, you know, they need some more practice and the AI bot's not going to be doing the work for them, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So here are all kinds of different bots that are here. So some of the ones that I like are just some of these fun idea generators. If students are working on a project, book suggestions, all kinds of them. Anytime I see one that I like, I can start and favorite it. But let's see. So for, you know, the spirit of thinking about our multilingual learners, this, this language learning tutor would be a great one to share with my ELLs to give them some practice should they need it. So if I have a student who speaks Spanish natively and they're learning English, then I can just set this up. This is just teacher controls. This is not what the student sees. And let's say I want to give them some 
everyday talk. And then I'll just generate, okay? So here we go. It's giving me a preview of what this bot might look like for my students. Give me some practice here. And again, some of those same accessibility features that I showed you are here for students. So it can read it aloud to my students. I can also use my voice to interact with this too. And then actions here can translate it to if I need to. And I can clarify, summarize it, adjust the link as well. So whenever I am ready for this to be used with my student, then I'll just go launch to students. And it does walk you through this guide tutorial every single time. Um, so to get started on this, my picture was hiding it. Whenever I want to launch a space for my students or a chat bot for my students, like the one we just did here, I select it. That removes it, and then it's available for my students. So I'll click the next button. I can name this if I want this to be like class period four or my name, then we can do that. I can specify my grade level and then launch room. So if you look here, I only have one selected. I could put multiple. So if I want my students to have different things they're working on, I could easily set up multiple bots here depending on what phase they are, maybe project planning, research, designing. Like maybe I have some students who just need help with ideas, or I have some students who need to be looking at the rubric or things like that, I can set up those spaces. So whenever I'm there, I'm gonna do launch and then it's super easy for my kids to get there. I just give them this link, they can scan it with a QR code or they can enter that code and then we are all set. So I can throw that in my Canvas course and we are good to go. And I can always go and close this. I'm gonna get some nice data here about what my students are saying. If there's any like warning signs or flags that does report it right away. If students are saying some things on there that are concerning, I get a report of that. I can also access the join info and show some of the tools that I have in this room set up and we are all good to go. So that is how you can use Magic School Student to give your ELLs, your MLLs, some guided practice, but you as a teacher can also go in and use it to plan your lessons, to translate content, and to reframe or rethink some of your activities. The other ones that I have listed on here, I'm not gonna dive, dive through and show you all of them, but they're very similar to Magic School, I would say, just the interface looks slightly different, but same functions. This one is Almanac, so it is a freemium. Uh, this is a little bit more robust than Magic School in that it can create an entire unit versus just individual lessons. And when I say unit, it can make slideshows, it can make leveled text. It is very dense in what it can make for you. Twee is a similar one. It's really helpful for ELA classes specifically. That's who the tool is designed for, but it can work for other content areas too. Okay, so. Moving onward, we're going to look at some different ways that you can boost some engagement in your classroom using AI. So this first one I'm going to show you is a freemium, and it's called Blockade Labs. And this is the only something that teachers have access to. So students do not have access to this tool just because of user agreements. But what you can do is create 360 or panoramic pictures in Blockade Labs. So they have some that are set up here already. You can try it out and it gives you a preview or you can build your own. So you do have a limit on the number of ones that you can make a month, but here we go. Here's the preview, an example one. I can create a brand new one. I just type out some words and phrases and it makes it for me. So the more clear and specific and descriptive you are, usually the better results you're going to get. But whenever I make a virtual world here in Blockade Labs, there's a link that I can use and I can share that on my screen. Just know that students can't go here and create, so it would have to be me showing this as the teacher. But I can also share it with other people if they wanted to take their students there as well. So here's just some examples of how teachers have used it, and then I'll show you the two other tools. Using it to create like scenes from novels and stories they've been studying to transport students there. If you're working with MLLs, maybe this is a great way to have students practice you know, using descriptive language. So maybe you have students fill out an exit ticket one day where they describe a space they would like to go to and then you take some of their responses, go into Blockade Labs and create it. And the next day you have it up on the screen and the student looks and sees, oh my gosh, that's the world that I imagined I dreamt up. And now it's in front of everyone. So, you know, me, me loving Harry Potter and this being a magic theme, this was my attempt at recreating uh, Hog, Hogsmeade and Harry Potter world. So just an example of how you can use it. 
So some of the others that have similar functions here that use AI to generate images are Adobe Firefly. There's technically Dolly or Microsoft Copilot, which you have to use a different browser than Chrome if you want to use those, but they do create some really awesome visuals. Uh, Adobe Firefly is something you can use in Google Chrome. It's totally free. Everyone in BCSE has access to it. So if I am here looking at this, here's some examples of the AI tools they have. So text effects, you can describe how you want the letter to look and it makes it. It could be great for, again, vocab, descriptive activities for MLLs. Generative fill kind of edits your pictures for you, but then text to image is the one that can be super fun. So if you want to use this as a bell ringer, again, maybe a chance for students to practice using descriptive language in your class or for you to imagine worlds or to create visuals that maybe your students haven't been to before, you can do that. So here's an example of what I'm going to do. And if you're wondering, how do I sign into this? You sign in with your BCS and Google account, but make sure you pick a school or organizational account to sign in. Otherwise, it'll say that you don't have all of these features or you're limited in the number of times you can use this tool. So just make sure you're using an organizational account and doing this. So you get all of the awesomeness and bells and whistles. So if I'm going to go through and practice using this tool, I'm going to say a Siberian Husky wearing a rain jacket. No, I'm going to do a snow jacket. Wearing a snow winter coat in the MLA. Something like typing in front of what are going to be people on the Zoom and really fumbling through how to spell all my words. All right, so it's gonna think here for a second before it makes my picture for me. So this is a good chance for your students to try this. Unlike Blockade Labs that students don't have access to, students do have access to this tool in Adobe. So this is great for students for making visuals for projects. What's nice is that you can download it. You can share this, edit it further if you need to, if you want to expand the size of the picture or expand that background, generative fill all kinds of things. We've had teachers in BCSC, like there's a teacher at North who's using this in her science class. I think it was Arpita, I'm gonna give a shout out to her. She was going through and she was using it to make like bulldogs and to put them in the different units of study that they had in her science class. So super fun, love the idea that I've seen people do this. And if you wanna adjust this further, you can. So mine look more like photos right now, but if I want it to look like art, I can change it. I can give it more feedback here. So again, the more specific and the more input information you give the AI, the better it is going to be. So, so fun. Look at all those huskies in their coats. It's like a mountain climbing husky. All right. And the last one is Canva. So Canva also has an image creator, almost like what we just did in Adobe Firefly, but the Canva one is called uh, Canva Magic. And it's one of those tools on the left-hand sidebar when you go into Canva, it's pretty popular right now. So it often shows up as a suggested tool, but I will show you more on that one when we get to the Canva section. So just some ideas for creating engagement for your students is taking them to different places and helping them envision different worlds and scenery. So another AI tool that you can use, and this is really more for boosting some interaction and in presentations you might be doing, and that is CuriePod. So CuriePod is a freemium, but I do have a discount code for you right here, Curiosity, that will upgrade your account and give you access to premium for three months. So we are exploring how we can maybe purchase this tool depending on what feedback we get from you all, um, but it is pretty spectacular. So it has lots of features. I'm not gonna show you all of them today, but I do have more tutorials linked on my YouTube channel and in this training. But what CuriePod can do is it can create a slideshow for you from just a couple of prompts. So it uses AI to create lesson resources, specifically slides. It can create a quiz. You can upload existing slideshow presentations you have, and it can translate them. It can also create some interactive questions. So when I think of CuriePod, I think of if you've ever used Nearpod or Pear Deck. It's kind of like that, but it adds some more features to it. So it can create things from scratch where you can't do that in the other tools. It can use AI to give some immediate feedback to your students, especially on some short answer and open-ended response type of questions. And it can do that feedback in multiple languages. And it can also create interactive questions and you know brain breaks, quizzes, formative checks, and can translate those as well. So lots of different features on here. They have a really great learning and professional development training center on their website. And if you go and complete some of their certification courses, it'll also unlock some of those premium features even beyond 
the three month trial code that I gave you. So here we go. Here are just some examples. So if I wanted to create a lesson from scratch, it's easy to do. Their new translation feature on that is pretty new. So I can come in here and I can say, I'm gonna make a seventh grade lesson. All right, my same standard here. And I want the second language to be in Spanish. So I don't, I'm imagining I don't have slides made for this already. And I'm gonna ask it to do some magic. So while that's thinking, I'm gonna talk you through a few other CuriPod features. So I'm just gonna open another tab here and show you what it can do. So it does take it a minute here to make those lessons. But if I wanted to curify my slides, basically that takes a static slideshow presentation that I have and it makes it interactive. So it adds in some questions, some brain breaks, some movement breaks for my students. So if you just want to make your slideshows more broken up, not so much you talking directly at students, this is a great way to do that. And we know that's great for our students, but especially our MLs to have those brain breaks, to chunk the content and to have some opportunities for them to give you uh, some checkpoints on their understanding so that you can steer the lesson depending on how they do. So those are some of those examples. It can help you create readings, level texts. There's all kinds of different resources on here. Vocab activities, writing activities, fairy tale, AI feedback, all different types of games and things on here. And they're constantly adding new ones. So I wanna show you an example of what it looks like when you host a session in here. So you get a nice little report here on how people did, who participated, how many questions they answered, the students, activities. So this is great if you wanna get a nice dashboard and really hone in on your student performance. But if I wanted to host this presentation, I can download my reports here, but what I love is I'm gonna go and edit this presentation. And then this is the interactive part of CuriPod. So your students join with a link and a QR code. You can also pull that up on the screen so students see what to do. This shows you the number of students who are joining. And then here are some of the different interactive questions that I have. So short answer. Uh, this one was just a poll. You have all different ways that you can do it. And there's a timer here. You can add time, decrease time. I just love it for those interactive pieces. And it plays fun music. I forgot to share my sound, so you're not hearing it right now. But it has some really fun music that comes with it automatically. You don't have to, you know, ask the AI to give the music. It does it there for you. So here we go. It even came up with a choice board. So this is all about the Harry Potter Hogwarts Four Houses, but could work in several different contexts. So that's an example of a lesson I already had made and I just launched it in CuriPod and launching a lesson in CuriPod is what gives it those interactive questions and responses for my students. So going back to where we asked it to make a lesson for us, uh, it made a lesson in English and in Spanish. So it's looking at ancient Chinese dynasties. It did a pretty good job. Like these are the, the main ones I would wanna talk about. I do feel like the images it makes are not great, but I can always go through and add my own media and pictures. I am very picky probably isn't shocking to any of you, but I can go through and adjust those as I need. So what it did here is it talks about the standards it covers, but what's nice is it has all of this information here in English and then it has it in Spanish. Like I don't have to go and remake an entirely new presentation. It has all of the questions and interactive pieces in both languages, which is not something you can currently do in some of those other interactive presentation tools. So whenever I'm ready to launch this, I do present and we're set. And if you're curious about some of the other AI tools that are in here, there is the uh, AI feedback. It only can give feedback in English and Spanish at this point in time, but it's great if you're doing some open-ended responses and you know you have a lot of Spanish speakers in your room, can be great for giving them the opportunity to use some translanguaging, so communicating across languages. All right, so moving forward, that was CuriePod. Uh, another way that you can support engagement for your students is just by giving them access to a tutor anytime, anywhere. So this supports engagement because it can remove some barriers for the students, give them a comfortable space to ask questions when maybe they're too nervous to do that in front of the whole room, um, or they just need something that's a little bit more challenging or scaffolded depending on where they are. So there are lots of AI chatbots out there. I have several that are listed. I already showed you Magic Student. 
Uh, Maizu, Mizu, I never know how to say it. I've heard it said there several different ways is another one. I will say that that one is very slow to load, but the one that I love is called School AI. And there are some specific chatbots in here for English language learners. Now, again, this is using AI to translate. It's not going to be 100% accurate and ideal in all situations. A human is always better, but here we go. So much like Magic Student allows you to go in and set up a space and some parameters for your students to interact with AI, this one does, but it has even more features and controls and what Magic Student does. So here's where you can just peruse some of the different options that are there gives you an example of what this looks like. It can give some nice adaptive practice for students. If I scroll further down, this is what the teacher dashboard looks like, and it actually color codes these based on what the students are saying. So if a student is struggling and is saying that, it flags it for you so you know. So this can be helpful for just getting a read on students that maybe isn't always easy to do when you just look over in the room and you know kind of pick up on their body language. Gives you some suggestions here on how the students are doing with some of the sample sets and problems it's providing to them. And it's just amazing. So you can sign in with Google, it is a freemium. So on the free version, there could be 150 people in a space that you have, a space is a chat bot. So 150 people in one day, which should be good for all of your classes, even if you're a secondary teacher. If not, then you can set up multiple spaces. But the ones that I love are some of these tutors. So. If I go and sign in, you can see some of the different ones that are here. So lots of AT, ACT prep, test prep, but the on the right-hand side where it says ELL tutor is where I can go through and set up a bot to help my students who are learning English, but this is one of their you know native languages that's out there. So all kinds of them that are here. So if I wanted to give my students practice with Nepali, it's always gonna give me a preview and then I'm gonna go back because I forgot to sign in. Because I wanna show you what this looks like. All right, so here are some of, we're actually gonna do Spanish because that's one I already have set up. But uh, gives me a nice code here, almost like what Magic Student did, a link, students can get in it that way. And then whenever I want to have my students look at this tool, uh, I give them that invite information. I could pause it at any point in time if I don't want them to be using this outside of my class, I can pause it. And it's gonna show me the participant list here and how my students are doing. If I wanted to go through and edit this tool a little bit further and get a preview of it, if I click the name of the space, it gives me a nice preview over here so I can see what this activity is looking like for my students. I can also go through and adjust some of the settings if I need to. So you can totally personalize this. If you want, you can make a chat bot for your students here on any topic you want in a matter of seconds. It can translate content, they can type with their voice, they can read with their ears, lots of nice accessibility features baked in. So with that being said, I wanna show you some of the other spaces I have created. So if you wanted to practice with one in the spirit of Eclipse in space, here is one that you can practice with, women in space. So I'm just gonna pull that up here on another profile of mine. So here we go, you can practice with either one of those. I'm gonna pull this up on a different Chrome profile so you can see what it looks like for a student. Loading, loading. So you do have to put in your name. So that's always great. So you know who it is. Actually, we're gonna pretend like this is my dog. I think I've already joined this session as myself, which is a little confusing when there's multiple me <laughs> in here. Okay, so. If I need this to be adjusted, I certainly can. I can speak, type with my voice. Um, let me move my recording controls here so I can see. Settings here, adjust your view. I can have it in Spanish too, or more languages. They are adding in more every single day. When I first previewed this tool first semester, there was four languages. Now there are so many. So this is just great for your students if you wanna give them some opportunities to have it in multiple languages. Again, not 100% accurate, but it's an option. I can ask it some questions and then it just goes through and it's trained to answer these type of questions. So I kind of get that, that personal touch, that tutor here. Uh, my teacher, you know, can be answering all these different types of questions essentially through this tool. It quizzes me on it. So this is what the student interface looks like. So if you wanted to tinker with those, I have two set up here for you. 
But that's just an idea of these chatbots. School AI is probably my personal favorite out of all these because I just feel like it has lots of features, lots of templates that are already built out that you can copy and pull from. And I just think it looks kind of nice and intuitive and slick. So other tools here to support engagement are tools that can help give feedback to our students so they have more checkpoints and information and knowing where they're going in our class. So a tool for doing that is an extension that's called Brisk. It is a freemium. I am about to get a code on this. It will give you premium access. They're supposed to get back to me tomorrow, so I'll update it in my slides as soon as I get it. But it's an extension, so it works in Chrome. It's up here. Here's what mine is. Um, but it, it basically what it allows you to do is anytime you pull up a website or a YouTube video or a blank Google Doc, it can help you create a text, assessment questions, activities related to that website or article, lots of different purposes and ways you can use this tool as well. So it's kind of like the other AI tools I've shown you, but it works anywhere and works really, really well with Google Docs and Google Slides. So that's where it has a little bit of an edge over Magic School. This will create something that you can readily use in Google Docs, whereas Magic School or ChatGPT, you have to copy it, paste it in one of those tools, and then kind of finesse it to where it looks good. So I want to show you an example of how you can use Brisk uh, for a variety of different ways, but specifically, I want to show you how you can use it to give students feedback. So I have an example here. Let's imagine that this, whoop, I got signed out. Let's imagine that my students turned in an essay about George Washington. And what I'm going to do is imagine that I'm going to give feedback to them. So ways that I've seen teachers use Brisk is it's kind of like this initial pass through. So students turn in a draft of an essay. You have 100 plus students. That's a lot of reading. This can give some initial feedback. And then maybe that next day, if you're doing like a station rotation in your room, or students are doing some independent work, you have conferencing with students, then you can have that deeper, more meaningful personal conversation with students about their writing. But this at least gives them some initial feedback that they can reflect on and use during the work time while you're conferencing with students individually. So here we go. If I need to pull up Brisk, it is super easy to do. I can click this little extension here at the top. And if you notice at the bottom of my screen, it pulled up this little icon. So here's an example of it. So this is an article or an essay I imagine the student wrote. This was not me, it's totally fake. I pulled it from somewhere else. But I'll click Brisk and then it asks me, what do I want to do? So I can inspect this writing for AI. The only thing I will say is AI detectors are very inaccurate. So I would never just take that and assume that it's 100% correct, just like AI is not 100% correct. I can create an activity based on this article, like this is probably not applicable because it's student work, but here's just some of the different examples of what it can make. It can translate it for my students, lesson plan, um, all different kinds of things. And if you see the little locked icon, that's because those are premium and my premium expired, but I'm gonna see if I can get you guys access to it. Uh, you can change the level of it, the reading level, but here's the one I wanna show you. So give feedback. There's several that are all free here. So I can align a rubric. So if I have a rubric for what I'm looking for in this essay, I can upload it here and it looks at that rubric and gives targeted feedback there. Um, same with this targeted one. I like this glow and grow because it gives some positives, some things to work on, and then some follow-up questions. So that's actually what I did already. And what it does is it makes this really nice table here. And it started at the very top of my students page so they can see it. It stands out to them. It's not buried. And it gave me some really nice things that my students did well, some things that I'm looking for, they need to work on, and then just some follow-up questions I have if things were unclear in the writing. So this can be great for giving students some nice checkpoints along the way. Studies have shown that the more often we give feedback and the more specific feedback we give, the better students do. But that's a little bit easier said than done, especially if you have a lot of students. So I love this tool for helping us in that effort so we can better support our students and give them more of an idea on how they're doing and progressing in our class. So that is brisk if you have questions. Let me know. So now we're just going to move into some translation tools and then we'll think about wrapping up here in a few minutes. And I know this is a longer training video, but there's just so many good things that I wanted to show you that I had a hard time cutting it into just one presentation.
So an obvious translate tool, shameless plug, if you want more translation tools in Google, watch my other PD Day recording. But Google Translate is like one of the original AI tools that we've been using for years. And there are so many amazing ones that are out there. So I'm just going to give you some examples of ones that are on the screen. The mobile app for uh, Google Translate is amazing. It can look at a picture. You can take a picture, hold it up to a sign, and it translates it from there. But it also can translate spoken word as well. Uh, if you want to use some resources to build vocabulary activities for your students, I have some spreadsheets here that are set up to where you type in a word in one column, it finds a definition on the web from Merriam-Webster, it pulls in a picture, and then it translates that word, and it could even translate the definitions into multiple languages at once. So there's more information on that in my slide deck I have linked here, but the templates are also there should you want them. The one that I love to show you is Canva Translate. So this came to be about a year ago, around this time, I think it was like February of 2023 was when this feature was unveiled to everyone and I've been obsessed ever since. So I have a guide here for you. So what Canva Translate does is it takes any design that you have and can translate it. Or if you have an activity that you want translated or a reading, you can upload a PDF, upload a file and it translates it. And the nice part is that once you upload something into Canva and it translates it, it makes it editable. So if you want to edit PDFs, this is your solution. If you know me, PD, PDF editing is not something that's very easy to do. There's a lot of tools out there that are paid that do it, but it's just not a very easy process. So this is really where I've been steering people if they need to edit a PDF. Um, and again, this is something that you can share with students directly. Canva is fantastic for that. But if I needed to translate something. It's super easy to do. If I want to upload a design, I can import a file from here. Like if I already have something that I can translate it, I can do it. Otherwise, I can translate an individual design should I need to. So I'm going to find design here that's not like 10,000 pages long, like some of my other ones are. As you can see, I've been using Canva quite a bit lately. So here we go. All right. And Canva is something that all staff and students have access to. So your students have these tools, as do you. And these all integrate into Canvas or LMS. So you can post them there. You can make assignments for students, whatever have you. So if I want this guide here to be translated, on my left-hand toolbar in Canva, and if it's hidden, you just click this little menu here if you want to see more. The very bottom is translate. If you don't see it there right away, then what you can do is go down to apps and search translate there and it'll pop up. But if I do translate, I'm going to say what language I want this translated into. And then I can have it do sections of text or the whole page. So we're going to have it do the entire page. And this works on multi-page documents as well. I have translated 50 page plus documents, 50 plus slides, lots and lots of stuff you can do. And what it does that's really cool is that it keeps my original version here in English, but then the next one is the one that is translated. So kind of makes it cool and that you have both versions here. So you can just share the one resource with your students and know that they have multiple options here in different language. And like I said, once it translates something, it makes it editable. So if you see here, I already made this in Canva, but if I had uploaded a PDF, I would be able to move these different text boxes around and edit this. So maybe I show this as my interpreter, they edit this and they make it more accurate because we know AI translation is not perfect, but that is Canva Translate. So totally free, you have access to it and it's just spectacular. All right, moving onward to some different ways that you can support representation in your classroom. So representation is thinking about our different senses, but also our different languages, presenting content in different ways, different reading levels and vocab. So Diffit is an amazing tool for doing this. What Diffit does is it's also an AI tool as are all of the tools that are in this presentation, but I can ask Diffit to create a leveled text on any topic that I want. So I can type in the topic, set the grade level, decide what language I want it to be in. I can paste in an article, a website, or a YouTube video, and it can create uh, a reading activity as well as assessment questions, or I can even upload a text or PDF and it does the same thing. So I have a tutorial here. If you want access to premium because the all of the features are about to be only under the paid version about March 30th, 31st, but I do have a link to upgrade your account. If you want that, 
send me an email and let me know. That'll give you access to the paid features through the end of June. So quite a bit of time to play with this, make lots of resources and fun things. The What they're going to take away in the free version are the number of exports that you can do and the type of export files that you have. So something that I love about Diffit, and I get a lot of questions about why is this tool different than some of the others, Diffit plays really, really nicely with Google Docs and Google Slides. So you can take something that it makes in Diffit and it automatically exports to Slides and Docs. It's there in a nice, clean, great looking file that you could share with students and they can edit. You can add it to a Canvas assignment and it can make copies for the students. So when I go in, it's helpful if you sign in with your BCIC Google account and I'm gonna ask it to make We're on this kick today. This is a topic I used to teach and I used to love to teach this. So we're just going to keep it consistent with that. And we're going to do a fifth grade reading level because it was seventh grade. We're going to keep it in English for now, but if I wanted to translate it, I could. I can paste in video, all those good things, or upload. And it's going to think. And while it thinks, here are just some of the examples of student activity templates if it can make for you. So these are in Google Slides. It makes really nice graphic organizers and Honestly, making graphic organizers is kind of a pain. It's very time consuming. It's not easy to do. This just saves you some of those steps. And I look back and I'm like, wow, some of the templates that are on here are ones I used to spend hours making myself. So amazing. And the nice thing about using graphic organizers is that there's a lot of research that shows that giving students access to those while they write, while they take notes, helps them retain the information and think deeper about it. So. I wanted to pull, it is this new thing now where it pulls pictures from the web, but I'll be frank in saying that not all of these pictures are great. It's just pulling from random keywords that you had in your topic. You can always select different ones or you can add your own. So I usually probably would go through and add my own. If I wanted to translate anything, it's here at the top. They have lots of different languages and they're always asking for input on what ones they want to include next time. So this is where you can give them some feedback and they can use it. So if I go further down, here we go. Here's the adapted reading passage it made for me. So if I wanna edit this, tweak it, make it longer, shorter, I can. This shows me the sources that it pulled from. I can copy this, put it elsewhere. If I like it, I can put it there. Uh, it does a nice summary. It makes some vocab words for my students that they need to know. If I wanna add more, I can add those and it generates more there for me. And I don't have to come up with the definition. It does it myself. But if I need to edit any one of those, I can. Multiple choice questions with answers. I can add more, delete more, edit them. Short answers, short answer questions with answers. The only one it doesn't give you answers for are the open-ended ones. So you still have to do some of the work in writing out some examples and knowing what you're looking for there. But I can also add more prompts, edit those, and whatever have you. So whenever I am ready to turn these into student-ready activities, I can scroll back up to the top of my page or at the bottom. This is where it says get student activities. And this is the part that's going to be taken away from the free version in the future. So I can still, I can save these. I can make it a Google Forms quiz. So what's nice about the Google Forms quiz is I can put the article, so the text it made, the reading at the top of the page. I can put my own videos and things in there if I want as well. And then it has those assessment questions and it's set up to be a self-grading Google Forms quiz. So that's really great if you're in a pinch, you need to make a lesson quickly, or you really just wanna do a quick formative check for understanding, it's fantastic. Otherwise, I can search for the type of activity template I wanted to create. There's anything from discussion and collaborative activities here to critical thinking type of questions. Um, there's even some great ones if you teach AP courses and you're trying to prep students for writing AP essay questions, which are a beast. Uh, re reading strategies, vocab, all kinds of great things. So I kind of like this bubble image one. And whenever I am ready to have my students use this, I'm gonna do get activity. And depending on what resource you select, it's going to ask you what all type of things it's going to put on this activity. So for this one, it's more of a graphic organizer. But if I would have selected like a reading response type of question, I could toggle on and off that the reading is included and all of those things. And the nice thing about exporting this into Google Slides or a Google Doc, depending on the template, is that now my students have access to Read and Write for Google to help them translate this. 
They have Google Translate. They can read with their ears. It just makes it much more accessible because it's putting it in a platform on Chrome that our students are already familiar with. So this first page here is almost always just some instructions for the teacher and the students. But here we go. We have my text here, space for students to write down some notes and highlight, mark things up, some vocab. And then as they go further down, I have my bubble map here where they can write some things, reflect. And if there's anything on here I want to delete, I can do that. This is now my own copy. So there's not a button to automatically add this into a Canvas assignment. I would have to add it as a file or set it up as an external tool in Canvas to create copies for my students, but it is doable. All right. So that is Diffit, and I can translate any of this too. So it's amazing. And you can always translate Google Docs too. It's really easy to do. So I thought I would show you that. So some of the other tools that are AI-based, not quite as robust as generative AI, are just some of these tools that help with um, text simplification and rewriting. So you can always use like a chat GPT to go through. So you can always use a generative AI tool to go through and rewrite things for your students. But if you want the students to be empowered to do this on their own, there are some AI tools that the students have access to that can help them with confusing words or changing words on text that they receive should they need to. So Read and Write for Google has that already. I shouldn't have closed that tab that we just had open. So Read and Write bought or partnered with the company called Rewordify. So Rewordify is more teacher focused, but now this is within Read and Write for Google. So if I have my text here from Diffit, and we're going to zoom in a little bit so you can actually see what I'm talking about. All right. So if I open up Rewordify, I can always go through. I can translate things if I need to. Um, I can adjust things. But if I am wanting to change some of these specific words, it's very easy for my students to do through Read and Write for Google. So I can take a screenshot of this. because Sometimes it doesn't capture things on a Google slide in the way that I want it to. And it's gonna think here for a second. And you'll know it's still thinking because it's like this colorful box around what I just selected. And whenever that appears, I can read with my ears, I can translate it, I can highlight it, but then I'll also see a button for rewordify and that rewords or changes some of these words and phrases so it's easier for my students to understand. So I do have uh, a tutorial here that walks you through how to do it if you wanna share that with your students. That's just a really great way of giving students some tools that they can use themselves. So other tools that you can use to help students understand content in more ways than just spoken word or written text is by using visuals. So I already showed you this one, but Adobe Firefly is great for that. So having students make their own visuals, you as the teacher creating them and having students practice describing them can be great, safe, uh, you know, low stakes ways for our students to practice speaking English and learning a new language. So here's just some examples of how teachers did it. This is all Harry Potter example, but the students went through and they created animals uh, in Adobe Firefly based on some of the descriptive words from Harry Potter. Other example, and this is actually a student example. This is, was a fourth grader that did this, but she made a phoenix. So use some of these different words to describe it. It was just a fun type of assignment the teacher did. Here are some that I created. So I made these also in Adobe Firefly. So like a potions classroom at Harry Potter and Hogwarts, and then just a traditional classroom. And the more the specific you are, the better results and images you're going to get. So Canva also has these tools where you can create visuals. So um, I'm just going to fly through and show you some examples of how teachers have used this. So in an English language arts classroom, but also in a classroom where there's a lot of ELLs, the students did this. And what they did was they were given figurative language and they created an image and you're supposed to guess what the figurative language was. So cats out of the bag, elephant in the room, raining cats and dogs, I actually don't remember what this one is. If you know, then you're you're better at this than I am. Okay. Here's other examples where the students in a history class used an AI image creator uh, to make visual representations of Great Depression era laws and legislations and work progress association type of contributions. So a great way to take a topic that is very you know, policy heavy language and making it a visual representation for our students to understand. And our brains love visuals. So 
really cool to do. This next one is going to sound super simple, but it is a helpful AI tool that goes a long way. And that is just using live captions. So there are live captions in like virtual tools like Google Meet and Zoom, but they also are available in Google Meet. So I'm going to turn them on really quickly in this presentation, but I'm not going to keep them on just because if you're watching this recording, then you'll have like double captions and it's going to be a lot. But this uses AI to text what you're speaking and then puts the text on the screen. Unfortunately, it's only available in English right now, but it's on Google's product roadmap to make these captions to where they can be translated. So hopefully soon, fingers crossed that we get that soon. But this is just great to turn on. There's been a lot of research and studies that show that captions can help students who are English language learners process and learn the new language. And they're just helpful for accessibility and hearing needs. So to turn them on in Google Slides, if I pull up a slides presentation, three dot button once I'm in presentation mode, and then captions preferences, and then I'll do control shift C or just click toggle captions on. So I have mine set up to where they're gonna be at the top of the screen and the largest font. That is just my personal preference, but it's up to you. And if you've seen me present before, I use these a lot and it really does do a good job of picking up, even if I'm at the very back of the room in the front of the room, what I'm saying. It does struggle with some words, like my name, it never quite gets my name right, but does a pretty good job with other content that I'm sharing. So if you're wondering, how can I use this on day to day if I'm not always in front of my room, instructing with my students? There was a scenario in one of our elementary schools that um, maybe this person's watching and she remembers this, where we had a student who needed uh, an alternative to just listening to his peers around him. Um, he had a hearing need and it was during the pandemic. So people were wearing masks, he couldn't read lips. Uh, so what we did is we had him pull up a blank Google slide. And when he was doing small group discussions, he turned on the live captions and it just pulled up on his screen. So then he could see what the students were saying. And it was just a really good way to make sure he still felt included. So this is not something you as the teacher has to turn on. Your students could turn this on, on a blank slide, on your presentation if they need to. And it just adds in that extra layer of accessibility to support our students. So from this same menu where I turned them on is where you can change the text position and the size. So for sake of not having double captions all over my screen for you, I'm gonna turn those off for now, but it's super easy to do. Another piece I would recommend is just giving transcripts to your students too, which is a printed out version of all of the text and words that are said in a video. And if you watch my other session for the PD day, I go in more detail on how to do that. And that's what this slide talks about. There's an AI tool that will generate the transcript for you and includes all the punctuation. So you don't have to go through and edit it yourself. All right, last little bit in this section is text to speech. So reading with your ears, as I like to say, that also uses AI to take the text and to create audio for it. Our students have lots of different tools that can help them with that in the classroom. We have Read Write Google, which is that wonderful purple puzzle piece that I can use at any point in time. Um, there's a feature that's actually baked into the students' Chromebooks. It's called Select and Speak. So anytime they're on the web, no matter what they're working on, they can use it, whether it's websites, PDFs, it works really nicely. And then I have a few other options here uh, for you to test out with your students if they have a personal preference. All right. And you can also use audio and video tools to create your own audio and video for students so they have other options than just written text or visuals. So there's lots of fun ways you can do this. Some of them are more student facing. In Canva, you can use magic media to make videos. You just type out words and it makes a video for you. So that can be one way. You can use like Screencastify or something to make your videos. But there are some AI tools that can help you with this as well. So Eleven Labs allows you to make text-to-speech voiceovers for any website or resource that you're looking at, and it uses AI to generate that. So if you're in a pinch and can't make the audio yourself, you can type out what you wanted to say, and it will do it for you. And it's available in multiple languages. Another one that I love is Animate Audio from Adobe. This is kind of silly, and your students have access to this too. Adobe just has some cool things. Um, so what it does is it makes a little animated character and it puts your voice over it. So you record yourself saying something and then it makes a little animated version of you and you can pick different characters for it. So it uses AI to pair your voice with the, the movements of the character, but it's a fun way to give feedback to your students or just to liven things up. Or if you have a student who's super camera shy, Maybe you give them that as an option so they can do a voice recording to explain their understanding, but they don't have the pressure of being on camera when they do that. And that is totally free. Uh, you can do multi-minute recordings 
Um, but I don't think you can do something that's like longer than 10 minutes, if I'm remembering correctly off the top of my head. Moving forward, last section here are just some AI tools to help with action and expression. So I have a little bit of executive functioning support here, but a lot with writing and showing understanding. So Goblin Tools, if you've heard me talk about this, this is one of my favorites. Uh, so what Goblin Tools does is it's fantastic. And I'm not just saying that because I personally like using this tool, but Goblin Tools allows you to create a checklist of different things you need to have done. It can help you with your writing. Um, it can help you detect tone or what someone else is trying to tell you in your writing. It can just be a nice little scaffold and support here for our multilingual students. So if you click the picture here, it'll pull it up. The web version, like what I'm on right now, is free. There is a mobile app, but it is 99 cents. It's only a one-time fee. So the benefit of having the mobile app and upgrading is that if you type out to-do list on your computer, sign into the mobile app, then you can see it there. It kind of talks between those different systems. So here are the different features within Goblin Tools. So Magic To Do, I can go through and say like, here's all the different things I need to get done today. I can brain dump my to-do list. And then what it does is it breaks down those different tasks and it gives me estimates on how much time it's gonna take me to do said items on my to-do list. So pretty spectacular, pretty amazing, and can really help our students break down different things that they need to do, like projects. The spicy meter is what helps you determine how much breaking down a task you want it to do for you. And you can also type with your voice as well. The formalizer is the assistant for writing. So allows you to make your writing more formal, gives you some nice feedback here. You can select you can do more sarcastic and less snarky, some funny ones there. Uh, the judge helps you gauge the tone of someone else's writing, as well as helps you gauge your own so you sound, you know, how you're intending to sound. Estimator helps you with gauging how much time it's going to take you to do something. Compiler helps you look at all the things you need to do, and the chef helps with recipes. So this helps with our multilingual students in breaking down their to-do list items. It does not translate content on here per se, but it can help our students with writing and adjusting their writing should they need to. Other tools, I'm not gonna show you these, I'm just gonna reference them, are some extensions that are free and available for our students to use. And those are Auto Highlight and Super Simple Highlighter. I do have video tutorials there if you want more of a guided walkthrough. But these tools, you pull them up on a website and for any website or article that you have pulled up, they will extract main ideas. So essentially they'll shorten that reading and give you the key details. So that's great if you're wanting to create a shorter reading for your students, or if you're wanting them to just focus on some of those main ideas versus being overwhelmed by a longer article. So those are available for staff and students to use. Uh, next one is voice typing. Again, this is like a, a very well-known accessibility tool. It's been around for a while, but it uses AI. So using your microphone on your device to type out, it's great just for students who might get so caught up in spelling or what word to use that they might be able to talk through what they're thinking better or say things verbally better than they can sitting there without getting writing block. So a great option here for your students. It's available in Google Docs. It's under the tools menu in Docs and that's what this video shows you, but it's also available on Read and Write for Google. So all of our students have access to this. All right, and these are just some writing support tools. So give some nice real-time feedback to students, gives them some suggestions on spelling and punctuation. Goblin Tools is one of those that I just showed you. Uh, Quillbot, uh, Read and Write for Google has something like that as well, baked into the toolbar. Grammarly is another one, and then Hemingway Editor. So all of the ones that I'm showing you right now are totally free. And are available for you to use as are your students all right so here is what Hemingway looks like every time you open this up it goes through a guided tutorial for you and gives you some advice on your writing so pretty spectacular and I apologize for like the frantic move over my computer was plugged in but it was saying it stopped charging so now we are good okay and here are just some last things I wanted to show you. I feel like I keep saying that, but this one's actually towards the end of the presentation if you're still here with me. And these are tools to help with speaking and presenting, which is, you know, verbal expression is a big step in language learning and is something we need to have our students do, but can be very intimidating. So Languate is great for multilingual learners. It is a freemium, so there's free things you can do and paid things. But what's really cool is it 
it helps you practice speaking. So you just go in, you make your account and you speak into your device and you say what your native language is, what you're trying to learn. And then it gives you feedback on how you did. And it gives you some tailored response, practice phrases to say to help you get better. So pretty spectacular. Um, I would really recommend checking it out, especially if you're an MLL teacher. Um, there's a lot you can do in the free version. And I haven't really seen very many AI tools that are quite out there like this one. So it's definitely worth looking into. So it's great for practice. Interview warm-up is another one. So it's not specifically designed for English language learners. So it's not necessarily going to give you feedback on learning a new language and speaking across languages. But this is great if you have students who are wanting to think about careers and get practice with that. If they have interviews, it gives you some nice practice interview questions and you speak into the device and practice answering them. So great for some students who might be doing that, some shadowing, all of that. And it's really nice because it walks you through a nice guided tutorial here. So you can speak into your device or type out your answer and gives you nice AI generated feedback from there. And that one is totally free. Other ones, uh, Speakable, again, very similar to Languate. Uh, you speak into your device and it uses AI to give you some feedback as well as a freemium too. And then lyrics training is kind of silly, but you pick from some, you know, kid safe and kid appropriate songs and it puts the lyrics on the screen. You can practice speaking them and practice learning the language along with it. All right. So that is what I have for you all today in this presentation. So as we wrap up, if you need to pause, to go back to look at more tutorials or to send me an email if you want to test out any of the tools that I've talked about, please do. Otherwise, now is a great time to set a goal for yourself. If there's a tool on here that you are really excited about or know would be a great fit for your role, your environment, and your students, make a plan, put an event on your calendar, send an email to yourself to try out that tool, and let me know how it goes. My email is on the screen if you have any questions. Uh, my YouTube has even more tutorials than what I was able to show you today, more specific targeted ones. Uh, but don't be a stranger. I love learning from you. And if you have success stories using these tools, please share. Otherwise, I hope you have a great rest of your day and thanks for joining.